Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zune, and all major podcast providers. You can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com where you can subscribe to our newsletter to find out about upcoming guests, features, events, and other shows on our network. If you have any questions or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or send us an email to questions at theorganicview.com. Recently, the European Commission proposed a two-year suspension on the use of three neonicotinoids after the European Food Safety Authority, otherwise known as EFSA, deemed their use to be an unacceptable risk. The ban failed to, to achieve a weighted majority and therefore was not passed. However, it is still subject to an appeal where environmentalists and bee health advocates are anticipating a victory. In this special series called The Neonicotinoid View, my guest co-host Tom Theobald and I will be joined by environmental and bee health advocate Bridget Strawbridge, who has been campaigning against neonicotinoids and is going to explain the recent developments in Europe with the proposed ban. So I would first like to welcome to the show my special guest host, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Hello, June. And our special guest today the lovely Bridget Strawbridge. Good afternoon, Bridget. Hi, June. Hello, Tom. Hello, Bridget. It's nice to meet you. You too. Bridget, could you please share with our audience a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the issue of neonicotinoids? Gosh, okay. Well, it it goes back a few years. Um, I was um, involved back in, I think, 2005 in a television series that aired over here called It's Not Easy Being Green. Um, I think it was shown in in the United States as well. So it basically, um, the BBC followed my my family and myself as we moved to Cornwall, and um, oh, we, we we kind of we bought an old small holding and we converted it and built a water wheel and put up wind turbines and solar panels and built compost toilet and um, started growing more of our own food. And basically the, what we wanted to do was to live a lower impact life. And um, this this was aired in eight um, episodes of, of the series. So following the airing of the series, I had emails from people all over the world, wherever it was being shown, people would email and say, you know, we'd like to, to do more, but we don't think we can because we haven't got land or we haven't got um the funds or so on and so forth and and i thought gosh no this is this is <laughs> this is so wrong everybody can do something everybody can make changes so i set up a charity called the big green idea i bought um an old double decker bus that had just been um decommissioned from a fleet um nearby and and had someone do it up for me so it had a, a solar power cinema upstairs and um just just basically we we went to towns and cities and uh, at schools, and wherever we went, the idea was that as people came to the bus, whether they were uh, men, women, children, or whatever their interests, we'd have something to show them. So, so we'd be talking to them about um, about alternative energies, obviously, and permaculture, soil composting, skin care, um, organic food, um, biodiversity, bees, and as time went on. I became aware that that the more people came towards the bus, the more I was thinking, oh, please, please let them ask me about bees. Um, This is what I really want to talk about. So this was at the same time as the headlines started to appear in the press about bee decline. And and I, I had I was sort of reading the headlines and thinking, wow, this is this is serious stuff. This is quite scary. At the time, I was thinking this is scary for the human race. Um, and I thought it was all about honeybees. Um, and, and gradually that was so, so. So now I'm sort of coming to about three years ago. I started to to realize that this was this was about more than just honeybees and CCD, that this was impacting on on other bee species and other insects and pollinators. And so for the last few years, I, I've basically spent my entire time researching, reading everything I can get my hands on, listening to everything, everyone who who has real knowledge in this area, to try and educate myself and be able to assimilate the facts and then pass them on to, to the people I speak to, the people I meet and the people who I connect with on the internet so that they too can get a grasp of the enormity of, 
of this problem. This is not just about honeybees. Bumblebees are, and solitary bees are massively important as pollinators. And there was recently um, a, a, some scientific research that was done by Stirling University. And basically it showed that um, bumblebee colonies that are ingesting field realistic amounts of neonicotinoids are devastating effects on their requeening. So on average, a bumblebee colony will produce 13 new queens. A bumblebee colony that has ingested the neonicotinoids, imidacloprid, um, in realistic field amounts will only produce two new queens. That's an 85% reduction. And, and the only other thing that's worth mentioning is, is that during that journey, I've fallen in love with bees. <laughs> so that's it in a nutshell, really. That brings me up to today. Bridget, uh, naturally, we've been watching the goings on over there very closely because this is a global issue. And recently there was a vote in the European Commission on the, the proposal to ban three of these neonicotinoids. And it's our understanding that this vote is sort of in limbo because it has failed to gain a weighted majority. Could you explain a little to those of us who don't understand your system too well just how this operates and what we may expect to come in the near future? Yes, okay, well, I can do that as best as I'm able. So, so my, basically, a weighted majority um, means that the larger, so I think we have 27 member states in the EU, and depending on the size of the population, some of these states have more votes to play with than others. So you might get a small state like Slovenia who um, voted for the ban, um, and then you get large member states like um, the United Kingdom and Germany who actually used their votes. They, they both abstained. Um, France, I think, has many votes and, and voted for the ban. So, so it's basically not down to one country, one vote. And had it been, I, I think we might have been in a, um, a position where we might the vote might have been carried. But um, as it is, there is now... Um, an appeal, there's going to be an appeal, and it, it's incredibly difficult to get to the bottom of what will happen um, in, in the appeal or what would happen even if uh, we, we have this same no vote in a couple of months' time. I think the vote is going to be now um, taken again sometime in May. And my understanding uh, is that whatever happens now, it looks highly likely that the, the European Commission will be able to push this partial ban forwards um, because we, we, we're in limbo, because we, we have no majority vote at the moment. In, so, in fact, they're obligated to do that, aren't they, under the law, under your laws? Yes, that is my understanding. So that bodes well. I know that the mood, the current mood amongst the, um, the organisations and individuals over here who are campaigning, campaigning for a ban, is optimistic that this, this ban will be imposed. Of course, the, the, the downside is that it is only a partial um, ban, but it's a big start. You know, and I think the important thing, really important thing to focus on here, is the awareness raising that this campaign has, um, has, has caused in the last couple of months, because because there's been a date that we've been working on, we were working towards the 14th of March, which is when the vote um, uh, uh, took, took place. Um, and it sort of motivated people all over, um, not just the United Kingdom, but Europe, to, to campaign, to, to lobby their, their local members of parliament, that's the MP, and also their members of the European par Parliament, so we have representatives as well who represent us in Europe, and, and both are being lobbied by individuals who feel passionately about this, um, you know, to the extent I, I, you, you will have um, seen the Avaz campaign. One were, of your yeah. uh, representatives has recently been lobbied to his distraction, hasn't he, <laughs> Owen Patterson? <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, yeah. <laughs> Owen Patterson. <clears throat> is our minister for the environment 
and that this this is a man who is pro um he's pro nuclear he's pro gm he's he's pro um neonicotinoids and he recently has complained he's actually um complained officially uh, and called for an email block after he has been um he calls it a, a cyber attack <laughs> because he's had over 80,000 emails from people who are concerned about these pesticides calling um, for him to invoke the precautionary principle, uh, uh, but too much for him. So he's, yes, he's, um, he's called for an email block on that, which is crazy, but fantastic that so many people actually took the trouble to... to yes. But, Bridget, it seems as though the UK appears to be particularly opposed to do anything yeah. It, why is that? Oh, gosh. So, so, well, OK, my opinion. This is just my opinion. Um, first of, of all, course. Um, I, I, I think we lobby, we, we, we campaigners and groups, campaign groups um, don't have any any funding behind us. We don't have enormous amounts of money behind us to to be able to lobby. We don't have um, as much influence as companies like Bayer and in particular Syngenta have in the UK. So, so there's the there's the power of the multinational versus the power of the individual there, and then added to this, um, and this is quite crucial, it is that the NFU, the National Farmers Union over here, uh, does not support a ban. Now, if our farmers or our farming union um, is is calling for um, for a no ban, asking the UK government not to support this ban, they are powerful. They have a powerful influence over our conservative government. Um, well, I know it's not just conservatives, but over the conservatives. So I think that it's got an awful lot to do with um, the fear that the farmers have that that should these pesticides, should should the the three um, neonics that are being proposed um, to be banned, should they be banned, they're worried that their crops will fail, and they have a lot of power. The NFU has a lot of power. Um, within within DEFRA and within the government, so that's that's my reading of the situation. I could be wrong, but but it seems seems pretty obvious to me. Uh, Bridget, we uh, have a growing uh, number of listeners in Europe because of interviews just like these. Are there key representatives that deserve special attention over there that that should be approached? Uh, what you mean? Okay, so for, as in, who do who does an individual speak to to try and get something done about this? Yeah, it's a little tricky it's over there, really isn't it? Really difficult because it and it is very confusing. It, even for you know, so it's either is it your MP or is it your MEP? It's certainly there's no point in emailing Owen Patterson because he's blocking um, your emails. So the answer is to to email your MP, your your local member of parliament, and also to look up on the internet and find out who your MEP is. Um, and to email them both. Now, um, the, the the average person will think, well, great, you know, I'm fired up, I want to do this, but they don't know what to write. Um, now, the, the charity Bug Life, Bug Life, um, the Invertebrate Conservation Trust, they have some fabulous um, suggested letters, wording for these letters on their website, um, as does Amanda Williams on her website, Buzz About Bees. And I'm pretty sure Phil Chandler um, on his BioBees website also has suggested wording. So my advice to people would be to to look at one of the these websites to just to help you get your wording um, and then to write both to your MP and your MEP. And the crucial thing here is you need to ask them to put pressure on Owen Patterson and on DEFRA to invoke the precautionary principle um, and, and to go along with, to, to vote for the European Commission's proposal for the partial ban. Um, the other thing people can do, and this is just, this is easy, people can vote with their pockets by, you know, choosing. I mean, there are an awful lot of, um, not supermarkets, but DIY stores and garden centres in the United Kingdom who have withdrawn off their own bat who have withdrawn the the products containing neonicotinoids from their their shelves um 
Friends of the Earth, again, have been very, very um, um, fundamental in, in achieving this by talking because they talk to these companies. So, so you know, you can you can basically choose who you support as to whether they are supporting the ban or not. And if you can afford to donate to an organization like Bug Life, then Bug Life will do this work for us. Um, Bug Life are, are at the front of this. They have been since 2009. Um, you know, they were the first charity to put the head above, head above the parapet and, and say, look, these, these substances are killing bees, full stop. Um, the evidence is overwhelming. So by supporting these organizations, um, you, you are also helping. Because I, I think it needs to be like a, I don't know, a 10 pronged attack. It's, you know, stop using um, pesticides yourself. Um, support the organizations who have withdrawn them from their shelves. Boycott those that haven't. Go go talk to your supermarket managers and say, do you, do you know if you have any products in this um, supermarket that that um, are contain neonicotinoids? Um, speak to your MP, your MEP, and and I think it's just awareness raising as well. Ask as many people as as you can. You know, have they heard of neonicotinoids? Have they heard of these bee killing pesticides? And if not, make it their business to find out. So, yes, yeah, it's a lot you. of effort. <laughs> I'd also like to mention the CBG Network and that's cbgnetwork.org. Uh, they have done an awful lot and they've been around, I think, the longest, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I've, we've, I've had interviews with Philip Memkis as well as um, other folks that are involved supporting this organization and they really focus on the science but uh, they're based actually in Germany they're not a UK organization but uh, also once again another very powerful organization that focuses on the science um, so folks you know wherever you're located look around to see who's near you or even if it's internet based try to show your support however you can and by all means definitely contact any of these elected officials Bridget thank you so much for coming on the show today it has been absolutely wonderful having you on to talk about your work and also to help encourage people to get involved you're very welcome it's been lovely talking with you <laughs> and Bridget could you share with our audience your website as well as your social media information so people can connect with you oh yes definitely so I do an awful lot of campaigning on Facebook just um, as Bridget Strawbridge and I also have a Facebook page that's called British Bees which of course is going to be mostly um, interesting to, to people in the UK so Twitter on Twitter I'm B Strawbridge B-E-E -E Strawbridge and my um, my site my blog I write an awful lot of um, um, posts about bees obviously um, and that's B Strawbridge, B E E Strawbridge um, dot blogspot dot com, I think. But if you put Bridget Strawbridge or B Strawbridge into Google, it, it, the first thing that comes up is my my site. So um, yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Bridget. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.